Hello, everyone. Sorry, that was so loud. Hello. Uh, well, hopefully you've gone by my uh, company's booth, Pivotal, and gotten some free stickers. There's also official Cloud Foundry chips, if you're interested in that. There's some flavors I'm not familiar with, like ketchup on chips. I suppose you put them on french fries, so it must be great on chips as well. Uh, but you can try that out. There's also books and, I don't know, other stuff. Anyhow, uh, this is a talk I wanted to go over. I spend a lot of time talking with large organizations about how they're trying to improve the way they do software and therefore improve their business. So if you're expecting uh, live coding or anything remotely related to uh, programming, there's, now there's a lot of other great talks going on. Uh, but this talk is basically about how people in those organizations uh, a very important role that comes about, the enterprise architect, what they sort of, how, what the, the problems they are finding with their role, and how maybe they can help out with doing things like DevOps and agile software development and lean design. Like what happens when we set up a decentralized organization of autonomous teams that are operating completely on their own, supported by something like Pivotal Cloud Foundry or other platforms, and, uh, you know, it used to be enterprise architects played some big role. And I talk with a lot of these organizations, and uh, they're full of enterprise architects. And I think there's all sorts of great things that they could be up to to help out with organizations improving their software. Uh, but I think mostly people don't really care, and they're not really trying to help them out too much. Uh, so, I don't know. I thought I would do that, uh, among other things. So this being a programming conference, I thought I'd go over my credentials uh, for development, uh, which, uh, I don't know, I developed software like 10 years ago before Git existed. So I have some extensive experience that's highly relevant uh, to things going on. But more seriously, uh, I'm, I'm Kote. My last name's C-O-T-E. Uh, if you're interested in this fantastic slide, I just posted them on my Twitter account, which is just C-O-T-E. Uh, and you get the other ones as well. But I've been an industry analyst and worked on mergers and acquisitions, and now I work at Pivotal doing what they call uh, advocacy, I guess. I talk with managers and enterprise architect types and executives, sometimes developers and things like that, just going over how organizations are shifting over to uh, do things like DevOps and site reliability engineering and get to the point where they can release their software on a, a weekly, if not daily basis, and improve their software. And there's all sorts of exciting other stuff that goes in there, but what I find is that organizations are very uh, consternated and uh, sort of self-loathing, and they don't really think that you can actually change over and improve things. To which I always say, Pivotal plays a really great referral bonus. So if you're interested in leaving an organization that can't change, you should talk with me afterwards. I'll point you towards the right sites. I'll buy you lunch. You have to stay 90 days, what you do on day 91, not my concern. But if you want to stay three months, that's great. Anyhow, uh, so let's, let's jump right into the topic. I think, in general, uh, and, and just this is a typo, my whole presentation isn't part of this quote. It actually ends right before the question mark. Uh, but I think it's good to kind of define what enterprise architecture is at first, right? Like, that's, that's always a fun thing to do. I'm sure, depending on what your role is, if you're an enterprise architect or not, you already have some um, colorful definitions in your head. But let, let's kind of go into this and first figure out what it is. Now, the thing that I've figured out is basically, any time you try to define this term, you're going to get screwed, right? Like, there's going to be people who are basically going to tell you how you're wrong and, uh, you know, well butt you and all this kind of stuff. So it's a perilous journey to go on to define what enterprise architecture is, let alone architecture. Uh, and there's a whole series of talks, and I'll refer to two that I think are, are pretty good if you want to go all mystic on what architecture is. But we'll nonetheless try to come up with a vague framework. I'll keep waving my hands around and gesticulating to kind of uh, add, as I say, color to it. But I always think it's good to keep an open mind about what enterprise architecture is in particular. And as you'll kind of see, a lot of it is being silly putty to fill in the cracks uh, of the organization uh, that don't fill themselves to anthropomorphize cracks, of all things. So I think typically, uh, this is one thing that we think of as enterprise architecture, I guess as a noun or a role. This is from a really great, I'll see if my point, look at that, my pointer works. This is from a really old, if you're into uh, good stuff, from 2006, a good vintage year. Uh, but it's this great book called Enterprise Architecture as Strategy. Now I recommend uh, sitting right next to a coffee machine when you read it, because it can be a little dry, but it's got great content in it. And it does go over, I think, a traditional, let's say classic idea of enterprise architecture. And often, the end result of it is something like this, right? I always think of these as burger diagrams because I'm very food-oriented. Uh, you might think of them as European sandwiches with bread on top uh, as, as a modification. But 
ultimately, an enterprise architect, one of the main things they're coming up with is describing, understanding, specifying, and governing the overall system that you have, right? They're trying to pull together everything that the organization does and kind of rationalize it out. And inherited from the object-oriented days where we had this obsession with, uh, um, what was the fancy word that people came up with, like don't repeat yourself, of like having shared services and making sure to consolidate. There's also a lot that goes into making sure that you have you know, only five single sign-on services instead of 20, but trying to reduce the, the duplication and have more sharing. But you end up with, you know, this is one of the things people often encounter as enterprise architecture. And I think these diagrams are actually fantastic, right? If you look at them, uh, you probably know how airlines works over there with uh, our friends at Delta. And, you know, unless you, you bank at the uh, Global Mattress Bank, you probably know how banking works. So you can kind of look at these quickly and get a, real, a good grasp of all the systems and components of things that are moving around. So, that, I mean, that's part of how we think of enterprise architecture. And, you know, I think we kind of miss a, a big part of what it's trying to do as a role and how it's helping a company out. And I think more of the grander scope of enterprise architecture, to use the old metaphor, like it's, it's always tragic in programming. We haven't been around long enough that we have to start using metaphors for everything because we can't explain it ourselves. But more of what I think of enterprise architecture is if we take the airline or the bank and think of it more as a city that has existing things, people moving in it, processes, different interests and stakeholders. It has to evolve. Every now and then it gets bombed or wiped out or whatever. But it's this ongoing life of the city that you have to manage and think about and govern. More of in a, a sort of long-term picture. But every now and then coming in and figuring out how do we get this building built or do this block. And so if you think about the complexities of, of managing cities and making sure that they last a long time, I think there's many similar sort of complexities and concerns that enterprise architects in the best way uh, should be thinking about and, and what they should be doing. So like I said, uh, you can lecture me afterwards about how I was wrong uh, once I leave. I'll be happy to hear about it. But I think there's two other talks from some pivotal friends of mine. The first one is a nice, like, comforting kind of mystic overview of what architecture is. And any good architecture talk sort of walks through, here's 50 things that it's not, and here's one thing that it may be, as they kind of distill down what it might be. And I think, I think uh, Matt Parker up there gives a good overview of that. I know you can't click on this right now, but if you were to get the slides, you could click on it. And then uh, my friend Matt Stein here, he's always good on what, what architecture is. And, Pretty much all of his talks are trying to figure out what architecture is, how that applies to enterprise architecture, and how you know, a big ball of ants and water relates to everything in life at once. So I would refer you to those talks uh, for further analysis. So assuming that we have a, uh, at least enough of a definition to spend the other 43 minutes of the talk with, uh, let's go over like, what the problem is. right? So we've got these enterprise architects who are trying to govern how their system works, how the city works kind of specify some zoning, how things should look, have standards of coding, frameworks you should use, maybe they know the number of, uh, you know, I don't know, complexity that you should have in, in your code. They're sort of saying, uh, what process do we follow to do things, and on and on and on. They make those fancy uh, burger diagrams for you. But I think nowadays, and this is what I encounter all the time, especially now that I uh, work mostly in Europe, I go talk with large organizations, and I have to uh, be careful because I'm always talking about in enabling developers to self-actualize and like, be able to deploy on a daily basis and do everything on their own. And then it turns out the room is entirely full of enterprise architects. And often after I talk, they whisper to me, uh, but what do we do? Uh, so it, it, it is sort of this problem comes up but over and over again of, of what, what should enterprise architects do. And I think, I think this quote from a, a couple years ago from uh, this, this guy, Mark, lots of Marks in this presentation, I, I guess. Uh, he, uh, he works at an American health insurance company called HCSC. And he's been having, bringing his teams to that point where they can deploy multiple times a week. And, you know, he has a, a, a good point here. If you don't know what a cab is, it's not a, a taxi in New York. It's a change advisory board, as, as I remember. Um, and a change advisory board, uh, I think I used to have to do this back when I uh, did programming. But, you know, you spend, you figure out who an enterprise architect is, and then you spend a couple days figuring out uh, a time you have available to go talk with them. And then you schedule that meeting because you have some code or a change you want to make. And then inevitably they cancel that meeting because something more important has come up. 
Uh, and then you have to schedule again, and maybe a couple weeks out, you're going to go to the change advisory board with uh, some diagrams that you have and some Word docs and maybe even some code. But, I mean, really, do enterprise architects know anything about code, right? So you're really going to go in there with a ver verification checklist and get them to approve some change you wanted. And obviously, that's going to take several weeks, if not a month. And that doesn't really work when you're trying to be, uh, I don't know, do fa fast-moving software or operate this quickly. And so I think that's, that's really where a lot of this problem comes from, is all of the functions that an enterprise architect does, the way they've done it forever, really, you're not really given that opportunity with all of the improvements that, that we've had in recent years and the way we want to do software. So, uh, you know, there's also, we see this in, uh, in the DevOps world all the time, and uh, this, this quote from 2004 has, has aged well. And this is maybe some of the nicer ways of saying that enterprise architects and DevOps don't work together. But according to the hallowed DevOps reports, that there's actually a pretty strong relationship between how many change advisory boards, how many cabs you do, how much enterprise architecture you do, and essentially the, uh, the high performance-ness of your team, right? So if you've read all the, uh, the eye goggling uh, or Googling or whatever it is, uh, DevOps reports, right? It's always like high performing teams are about 5 million times more effective than lower performing teams, uh, which is a, you know, over-exaggeration. But one of the things that they find consistently is that the longer review cycle you have, instead of getting your software out quickly, the more damaging uh, it is to your overall uh, quality of, of your project. Now, that all sounds great, right? We're all just going to like deploy to production automatically. And certainly, if we're using some great platform that takes care of everything for us and make sure we don't uh, shoot ourselves in the foot or stumble over the foot, then that becomes easier. But I think even if your technology is, is up to this notion of deploying very frequently, you still encounter some complexity problems. And so this is uh, an enterprise architecture. This looks a little more friendly because there's people on it, right? But there's a this is an enterprise architecture of this company, uh, Comcast, a big uh, telco, video, everything sort of company for uh, telecommunications and things like that. And this is a diagram of one of their, if I remember, it's the, the ESP, the Enterprise Service Platform. Uh, and essentially, these, this is the entire system for if you, are, if you pay for their cable, from buying the cable, changing the cable, sending people out to fix it, running the back-end stuff that signs you up and takes care of your accounts, you got your IVR, all the stuff, right? And, you know, uh, this, this simplistic diagram kind of belies the, uh, the complexity of it. And that would be fine to sort of like deal with something like this. And you still would even need some kind of oversight. Like let's say at best you've got maybe, let's be really charitable, like uh, 20 or so different teams that maybe could be operating over this. I mean, you have a tremendous amount of, uh, of teams that need to coordinate around this and how they're going to operate. So it's probably good not to have them all coordinating on their own, but have maybe someone helping them out or someone's helping them out, which is you know, a little bit around the area of, of what an enterprise architect would do. But in reality, what you actually see in organizations is that they tend to have multiple of those types of systems, right? So in larger organizations and government organizations, they have many, many more of these complicated systems they're dealing with. Uh, and sometimes they're duplications of the same exact system because companies have merged over the years and various things have happened. But even that, I think, is a little like misleading. Like usually it's more like this. Uh, I don't know where you work, but organizations I've talked to and worked in the past, their systems are more like this and they have all this huge array of different systems, right? So it's hard to think about if we had all these self, these autonomous devops -y teams, if we were, you were operating, like what they would do to manage this. So probably, and, and you know, what you generally experience is that you have some sort of function or, or people usually, hopefully not robots, who are looking over all of this and trying to figure out, if anything, how they coordinate kind of understand what these things do and then feed that back into whatever maybe even annual decision process to do it or not or to fund it, right? So this is a, a huge issue that we have and it kind of leads to this amount of complexity over the years has led to port, sort of the, the, the bad idea of enterprise architecture that, that we encounter all the time is that once you were like a very agile, swift moving like little boat maybe and then you got more successful and maybe you're one of those like somewhat uh, I don't know, sort of bigger boats, but eventually when you become very successful, you turn into like this giant slow-moving paddle boat, which, you know, it has all these rules that are established, these, these uh, sort of governance, as they call them. You might even have standards that you follow and all sorts of certifications, and you just kind of like that big wheel on the back, you just kind of plod along with that low, slow thud noise as you're sort of uh, hopefully getting somewhere. And, you know, 
I like to think of these as, uh, I don't know if you've ever been on a, on a booze cruise, but it always sounds great, right? Like we're gonna get a bunch of free drinks and go on a boat, and if you're like me, you have like a drink or two, and then you realize I'm stuck on this boat for three hours, unless I wanna swim somewhere. And I think you know, the feeling that you get in a lot of organizations is like that. It sounded really good at, at first, but now you're kind of locked into it, and you need to figure out a way of, uh, of changing it around. So, all of that situation, uh, uh, Put together, I think you can still reconcile these two things. And I think more importantly, for people who do are enterprise architects, or maybe you don't want to use that word, but you're interested in the overall health of the portfolio and what to do, I think there are many, many things that this enterprise architect role could be doing to help out organizations, just like Mark was saying, that are deploying multiple times a week. So there's good work that they should be doing, and it would be terrible just to like set fire to the uh, the paddle boat there and lose all of the potential value it has and instead figure out how to use that in the rest of your organization. So first, let's look at, uh, uh, there's about three areas we'll go over. And I think let's start with how you change the organization in the first part, right? So most organizations I talk with, uh, I guess because I'm talking with them, they're not perfect. Otherwise, there wouldn't be anything for my company to sell them. So I often only talk to people who have problems. Kind of, a, I guess, the reverse of a halo effect, like a pitchfork effect. I think things are worse than they actually are. Uh, but most organizations that are larger organizations, they're not really satisfied with doing things on a six or nine month cycle, right? They want to deploy their software more quickly. And the reason they want to deploy their software is to really put in place a more design-oriented uh, approach to their software, where let's just take a week. We deploy our software every week. We observe how people use it. And then the important part people often forget is we see if they're using it in a productive way. If there's some way we could improve the software, if uh, they're taking a long time to do something, if it solved the problem the way we thought originally, basically we're going through that fa fast feedback cycle of doing things. So, Pretty much every organization I talk with uh, really wants to switch over to that way of doing software. And more importantly, the results that you get where your software is improving and you don't have like a terrible software experience. So getting to that point, again, thinking of a, a large scale organization takes a tremendous amount of, of leadership. And what I mean by leadership are, you know, sort of executives and high level managers, uh, and as we'll get to enterprise architects, but people who can actually make big changes over an organization if they can figure out how to do it. And I think, you know, as, as you think through the, the kind of new structure that companies want to arrange around, right? So usually, if you've heard any, uh, you know, DevOps person talk, they'll talk about how most organizations are set up in a, uh, they'll say, siloed approach. So they have a functional organization with the, you know, the developers, the business analysts, and then you got the, uh, the DBA people and the network admins who never seem to want to do anything for you. And then you got the security people and the testing people. And like you got a huge array of people all managed by different groups and communicating with each other through uh, tickets and help desks and kind of loathing each other is sort of like their conviviality. So typically what you see when you move to a, uh, a, a more, let's say, I don't know, DevOps or cloud native organization is instead you create these balanced teams that are focused around one um, application or domain or let's say experience from an end user's perspective or from another, another team using it as, as a service or something like that. So again, everyone's familiar with banking. So you can kind of think we have these dedicated teams of people who are designers, developers, product managers, and maybe some other roles, but those are the core. And they'll, for example, handle uh, processing mortgage applications or doing approvals, and they must lead exciting lives. Or you have people who are working on doing transfers or paying your credit card bill. And these product teams, as we call them, are just fully dedicated to that task, and they work on it week to week. Um, and because they've got a whole bunch of cloud automation and exciting platform stuff underneath, they don't have to spend all that time uh, requisitioning hardware, and they actually can even get to the point where they can manage a, a fair amount, but not all of it, in uh, production. So then underneath that, you have these people running a platform. Uh, of course, we have the best one possible. But, you know, you can think of them as the site reliability engineer people or whoever is taking care of your infrastructure. And they, they have a role of enabling all of the developers on top there to uh, basically, you know, use a platform as a service, do things in a completely uh, self-service oriented way. So affecting all that change, if you remember back to the complexity of Comcast, right, over all these different teams. So I've got, uh, let's see if I can impress you with counting. I've got basically uh, five teams up here. But again, imagine you've got maybe 500 teams, right? So that takes a pretty good layer of, uh, of management and leadership up there to come up with what we're gonna do, 
to figure out how to divide the teams and to take care of uh, budgeting and even ridiculous things like, um, you know, maybe instead of cubicles, if we want to collaborate, we should have a big open space. And that's a surprisingly hard thing to, uh, to take care of. So you have the, the management layer that needs to be working on things. And it's a natural fit that you would assume someone who is an enterprise architect had experience with the organization, knew even individuals and what their, uh, their hang-ups are and what they're interested in, knows conceivably about all the various systems in the burger, that they would have an important role in understanding this, this system. In the same way that if you were to approach an existing legacy system, you would want someone who could kind of help analyze it and figure out the components and move it together, but then also start to program that system and, and equally program this organization and come up with new ideas of how to arrange things and run them. And it probably would be good to have someone technical uh, like an EA involved in, in helping out with that. So that's a role that, you know, their role at the leadership level, I think, is often overlooked. And it's just assumed that, I don't know, they don't have anything to offer there. But Again, it seems like an area where they would immediate, enterprise architects would immediately fit in and, in, in fact, uh, be needed. I don't know if they need to wear a tie or not. Maybe you could take one off. Uh, but they definitely need uh, you know, a mustache or a cool haircut. <laughs> so part of that, and just to give you uh, an example of what that looks like. Uh, so I always spend way, I used to work in strategy and M&A, so I spend way too much time thinking about that. I can, I can also tell you how to properly use the word um, uh, what do you call it, you know, synergy, if you're interested in that. I've studied many years. I can precisely use it, and you too can learn how to. Um, or you can learn how to use it in a really sarcastic way. Anyhow, uh, so this is uh, one of the original Toyota looms. And if you know anything about Toyota, they basically invented software development, as we understand it now, uh, through lean manufacturing. I'm not sure of where those connected up, but somehow they really informed the way we think about software. And uh, I remember I was in, I was in a, uh, a great talk up in Ypsilanti, of all places, uh, and one of the uh, sort of professors, uh, I, I forget his name, unfortunately, uh, of Lean was going over you know, how it evolved at Toyota and uh, how it's gotten into software development. And the question that I always had about this was, you know, basically the history is Toyota did looms, and then the, uh, I forget his name, but one of Toyota's uh, sons, he wanted to get into cars, so they did cars and, and now and so forth and so on, right? But there's a question when it comes to strategy, like lean is great and process improvement is great, but like who decides to make looms and who decides to make cars? Like how do you walk through that feasibility of like we should do cars? Like as an example, uh, there's, a, there's a retailer, Sears, which I think has gone bankrupt recently. And at some point they decided it'd be really smart to sell insurance uh, in, in their, their stores. And so that would be the kind of thing that you would want some sort of technical uh, sort of input on, right? Like similarly, you could think like we're a, uh, I don't know, we're a company that like assures that escalators and elevators run safely and have a good interface to them. And right, what we're gonna do now is get into the uh, moped delivery food business because that obviously translates. So you might need some sort of technical input, just more people who help guide your strategy along. And because, hopefully, of their understanding of how computers work and software and the benefits and limitations, whenever the sort of executives and leadership at a company get together, someone like an EA should be there to kind of inform them and help guide them along and maybe even suggest that, you know, cap uh, capabilities in loom making and understanding translates pretty well to, to car making which I'm not really sure if that's the case. I think ultimately the son just thought cars were cool and he wanted to make cars, which that's a valid strategy if you sort of own the company. So there's some other things that I think uh, enterprise architects can, how they can get involved and become part of the leadership team. Again, at these large organizations that are trying to change over from a traditional service management approach to more of a product approach, right? A, from a project to a product approach. So first you often hear about the organization needs to create a, a culture of innovation and risk taking and you gotta have blameless postmortems and 10 ways of making coffee and people should be able to take their dogs and, uh, to work, all these kind of things. Uh, you're probably already wearing flip-flops, which people really like you for when it's warmer. But, you know, I think, I think that kind of role of figuring out, again, how to program the culture, knowing the current state and this state of innovation that you want, like, unless you have a technical background and, again, a view of the entire company over time, you're not going to do as well at that programming of the organization as possible. 
Now, there's all sorts of things. There's actually a, a, a whole other little sub-talk that, that I gave uh, back in Singapore, I think, earlier this week, that kind of goes over some of the tactical things uh, that leaders try to do, how they change over the way they manage and do things like give feedback, how they set goals, how they establish trust, not only of the staff, that they trust the staff will be doing uh, something in this new product-oriented way, but also that the staff trust them, right? So most leadership in companies, I shouldn't say most, but if you're in a bad company, it's very typical that leadership tells you to do something one year and then you see them mysteriously in a puff of smoke in 12 months and they tell you another thing and then there's another puff of smoke another year and they keep telling you to change and transform and it's always different year to year and you soon learn because you don't trust them that basically I should do the opposite of whatever they tell me if I wanna survive in my career. So leadership gets much more involved in changing over to a uh, much more healthy product-centric organization. And I think if you just think through it briefly, it's pretty clear that having an enterprise architect there, assuming they're not someone that everyone is completely uh, disgusted with, which hopefully isn't the case, but they're people who can really be informative about what's actually happening, how teams should be formed, how technology is actually used, and constantly feeding into this idea of how we should uh, do things around here. A very uh, I don't know, brief definition of uh, what culture is. So as an example, uh, I think one of the core things that I think an enterprise architect can help out with, especially uh, starting and then kind of ongoing, uh, if you kind of think of enterprise architects with this, uh, this metaphor of gardening, right? So we've got this gigantic, uh, sort of wild, never fully tamed, if you will, sort of huge uh, portfolio of applications and things that you have to constantly go out and garden and fix and pay attention to or they get completely overrun, right? So you need some, uh, some groundskeepers, like that guy in Star Trek who keeps showing up all the time back at the academy. And uh, you know, he's gotta help you out, guide you along, and talk to you when you're in doubt about things in his snarky way. Uh, or get taken over by aliens and be the leader, which is a problem. But I think an, what an enterprise architect initially can help out with a, a huge amount is figuring out what these teams are. Right? So I kind of went over briefly the, uh, the notion of these, uh, these product teams, right? And again, the very simple example is let's just take these five like areas or, or domains or whatever. Uh, and so if I'm, if I'm on the bill pay team and I'm probably maybe like, let's say eight to 12 people on that team. And on this team, we have all of the authority. We kind of own that product, right? And we own the development of it, determining what features we're gonna do each week. We figure out how we want to proceed doing it. We're completely autonomous. And because we can deploy weekly, if not daily, again, it gives us that fast feedback loop of what we should be doing. And we become very intimate, if you will, with the customer. So that's one team, right, bill pay, which depending on the complexity might even be more than one team. But you set up all these product teams. And again, you think about if you were to have many, many of these teams, or even getting to the point where you're trying to figure out which teams to, uh, to create. Like any given unit of these teams is gonna have some opinions, right? But they're not gonna be able to have sort of like, I don't know, a Star Wars Galactic Senate where they actually accomplish anything, right? So you think of an organization of like 500 or so of these teams and like how are they one gonna self-organize into that in the first place, right? Like you're not, maybe this room would suffice, but you're just not gonna be able to even get them together to uh, decide on doing anything in the first place, right? So. Obviously, it's good for your leadership to get involved, but more than likely, the enterprise architects are gonna be even better at figuring out what those teams should be, right? And, you know, they can go through whatever the process of the day is to figure out what these things are, whether it's like, you know, domain-driven design or figuring out, uh, you know, you do using like event storming or whatever out there to drive what those domains are. But somehow you need a system to arrive at what those products are uh, those product teams. And more than just a system, you need to actually like, you know, the, the, the fatal flaw in most processes is you have to actually do it. People forget about that. So then you need to set up those teams. And again, hopefully, along with other people, but the enterprise architect, by the nature of their job ongoing, should have an idea of what the system is, how it, as we say, maps back to the business. And then also they should be the people who like these, uh, we're very well dressed. That one guy should have tucked his shirt in, I guess, to be consistent. But you know, they should be the ones who are facilitating that and running that, right? Rather than leaving it up to the, the Galactic Senate to do it. And again, as with all these things, these are not maybe things that a lot of EAs are interested in doing, but it's one of those cracks, I think, that often falls in when uh, large organizations are looking to change themselves, that they're very well prepared to be uh, silly putty for. So then, uh, as a related thing, uh, you know, you also have, uh, you know, as you probably learned, uh, everything needs to be a uh, microservice nowadays. 
And not only that, it probably should be event-driven, and uh, you should have your independent teams and have your various frameworks uh, to work on things. You've got to divide things up that way. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck like doing monolithic applications, and I don't know, you're not going to be able to update you know, WebSphere or something like that. So you need to be on, on microservices, essentially, or you might as well be doing like you know, FileMaker or something to run your organization. Um, and you know, using the Netflix example is a little bit, as my friend Paul here will tell you, is not exactly accurate, right? Few people have that kind of complexity in, in their microservices, or maybe you'd like to. But this is another area, again, thinking of the role of an enterprise architect as, as hopefully, maybe they don't know everything, but having the opportunity to see everything, kind of like, uh, how do you say it, Eye of Saron or whatever, like, or Saron, or maybe someone afterwards can tell me after I've left. Uh, but essentially, someone who has this idea of like, here's all these various services that people are developing, and at the very least, I might want to specify like how they talk with each other. And I shouldn't be a single thing, but we might all want to use the same way of talking with each other, or saying, here I am, having a descriptor of what it is, similar ways of doing error recovery, so forth and so on, right? Like, if I treat each of the product teams and each service as a black box, then I'll try to be responsible and not tell them how to live their life. But when it comes to combining together those, again, to use the example, 500 various teams, like, someone should probably coordinate that. I mean, I remember, I used to always think, like, well, the way you coordinate that is to, like, go read the documentation, which sounds fanciful and, uh, and nice if someone would write that. But this is another instance of, without going down the uh, uh, calcifying and concreting role, you know, the, the thing that ESBs and SOA and WS star kind of brought to. And I don't think doing this kind of architecture in the large has existed well enough to know if it will solve the problems that created that. But that, again, seems like something that you wouldn't necessarily want your galactic senate of product teams just <laughs> deciding on. And instead, there probably are some facilitating roles to kind of move around, move along to figure out this uh, bowl of spaghetti. Now, that's like the fun part, right? Here, what we're doing is creating our legacy software, uh, which will be the software that we'll worry about tomorrow. But today, it's awesome, right? Uh, but there's also an issue of all of your existing software, I guess your macro services, uh, if you will. Now, if you're one of the people on these product teams, you probably do not want to work on the legacy systems, right? Because I often think of legacy as like, uh, you know, it's a software that you have to change that no one wants to change, because otherwise you'd call it your software, right? Like no one goes around calling software they like legacy software. But someone has to deal with this software, right? Like they've got to figure out what's the life cycle that we have on this, how do we interact with it, what's the most cost-effective, uh, sort of risk-free way to keep this thing going, what do we even do with all of this stuff? And maybe the enterprise architects you don't like, you punish them by making them work on this stuff, but someone has to figure out that portfolio and, and do something with it, right? So again, uh, maybe you're one of these rare product team type people who would love to work on a green screen application for uh, getting a refund after someone has checked into a flight because they decided not to take it or other sort of thrilling adventures that you can have. But you're probably not. Uh, so someone needs to orchestrate and drive how you're going to be dealing with legacy software. And again, I think people in the enterprise architecture role are very well suited for that. Uh, and it's something that they could help out with. Hopefully, they uh, understand that and maybe even uh, worked on it, which maybe they get cursed for a lot. So uh, next, I think, so if you think about that, that structure of uh, the, the, the sort of money-hungry business on top, or if you're not into profit, the mission-hungry uh, sort of civilian bureaucratic government organization, and leaders and product teams, there's frequently a team underneath who are the platform team. Again, you can think of them as site reliability engineers or... Uh, to use my friend Paul, there's you know a joke. They're the DevOps, the the DevOps people, uh, which you know uh, you can't have a DevOps person or something. Uh, but essentially, uh, there is this collection of technology you have under there that hopefully is as standardized and centralized as possible, so that you don't sort of fall into the anti-pattern of each of those 500 teams has their own stack all the way down to the dirt of your data center, right? Like that's usually not an ideal ideal way to operate. And again, also what you want is to have things be as self-service as possible to allow people to like, you know, add a column to a database without waiting two weeks to talk to a DBA and convince them that it's not going to destroy the world if they do this. And on and on and on, right? Like you want them to be very autonomous. And so this defining what this platform is, and this includes things like your build pipeline and all sorts of other things, I think becomes very important for large organizations. And again, it's something uh, that especially enterprise architects 
if they can get back to the mindset of being product oriented, are pretty well positioned uh, to contribute to, right? So this is, uh, this is Vincent from uh, Rabobank, and he brings up this goal, right? And, and this is a very like, leadershipy way of thinking is like, so I'm going in and I'm telling these teams that they're gonna be completely autonomous and they're gonna operate well on their own and it's gonna be their responsibility for their software to be successful. And if I don't really put in place all the tooling that's needed so they actually don't have dependencies on people, like that's not very responsible and they're probably gonna fail at doing that, right? So a lot, probably one of the primary roles at the start that an enterprise architect can help out with is saying, what is that platform? What does it need to do? Like, uh, what are good ones for us to put in place? What would be compatible with the way we do things? What fits in here? How does our long-term planning fit in with this? Like, what are our current things? For example, doing uh, build pipelines, do we just go with that or something else? So there's this constant churning at the beginning, which hopefully uh, is tested out by actually doing small projects and seeing if something works. But again, if you think back to those 500 teams, like even if you let them kind of be uh, self-actualizing and emergent, you would probably end up with you know many, many different ways of doing the same thing. And then you'll be in that legacy trap of needing to disentangle everything uh, and not having a more centralized, standardized way of approaching it. So I think it's, it's valuable for uh, EAs to think about how they could help out with that. Uh, and you know, often what, I, what I've heard from large organizations that are moving over to a more DevOps, uh, sort of lean design driven way of doing things, is sometimes uh, the EAs aren't interested in doing sort of platform work. Like sounds like a lot of work instead of just updating documents and things. And so they often find uh, some sort of volunteers who are very driven to work on infrastructure software, which is usually easy if you have sort of younger developers because, uh, you know, I thought this was just me when I was in my 20s, but I loved doing any sort of software development that didn't actually include an application, like frameworks and like managing my builds, building platforms, and all of my friends, they often use like HP Lovecraft names for it, but they would come up with these mega platforms that did everything for you. Uh, so usually you can find people like that uh, if you, you know, have enough, uh, I don't know, young people or people who are just kind of stuck in that mindset. Uh, but, you know, you, so you can find these volunteers and they often end up building a platform. And I've talked with teams like this and they go over, we built this platform and then we consulted with the product teams who wanted to use it. And I'll often tell them like, oh, it sounds like you're an enterprise architect. And then they get very serious and they're like, don't ever say that again where anyone that I work with can hear because if they think I'm an enterprise architect, they will not want to work with me. But they very much so get into that role of providing not only like the architecture and the tooling, but if you think about it, they're actually providing a runtime for those big burger diagrams, right? So they have a diagram of what their enterprise architecture th should look like, and then their job very quickly becomes, well, now you should write the code and deliver it, right? And by write code, it's a little loose when it comes to putting a platform in place. It's not like you're like I and my friends were, you're writing it from the ground up, but you are putting that product in place and managing it exactly like you would a product. In the same way that your product teams are deploying on a weekly basis, observing how people are using it, you're also observing and treating those product teams as your customers and really getting to the point where you're uh, working on that product instead of just publishing your, your diagrams around. So, uh, you know, I think that kind of gets to the point, as, as you, can, uh, you can sort of project out or interpolate if I'm using that word correctly, uh, that essentially what you get to is if, you're, if your enterprise architects are building that platform and specifying it, they kind of get stuck, depending on your, your perspective, they get stuck in this trap of DevOps or this delightful outcome of DevOps where now they run it and are responsible of it, right? I'm never really sure if, if developers actually get given pagers. That seems like a good way to get them to find another job where they can work for at least 90 days and make me happy. Uh, but uh, I, I, think, I think you do get to the point where, again, the enterprise architects go back to coding and they go back to doing a product and they are responsible for running that platform, for running their enterprise architecture, right? And it's kind of like a lot of software that I, I use, which um, I file a lot of expenses because I travel around. And, and to be fair, our expense software is actually pretty good. But every now and then, uh, you encounter something in our expensing software, or maybe your own sort of consumer stuff, and I stop and I, I, I don't say it out loud, but I sort of say out loud, like, I don't think the people who wrote this software ever actually use it, right? And probably a lot of those enterprise architectures that you've had the delight of using, you have that same notion of like, 
why do I have to do this? They don't understand why it's always they, right? They don't understand why it's annoying, why it doesn't work. And so if you take more of this product mentality as, as an EA, you write the product, you have to support it, you observe how people use it, you're much well positioned to actually do good work, right? So, and that's kind of like the last uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, line to throw out to uh, uh, the sort of enterprise architect, you know, frog boiling in a pan is like, Maybe at one point you actually like doing software instead of diagrams, instead of just diagrams. So now is your chance to get back to doing software, which is often an appealing thing to give to uh, sort of creaky uh, senior staff who don't want to change their ways. They often remember, uh, you know, I used to really like coding. And now they get the chance to go back and do that in a way that really takes advantage of the skills they have and probably doesn't decrease their pay uh, very much, we would hope. So finally, rounding up, and then there'll be just a little bit of uh, time for questions. If, if there's any. Um, I think there's a few other things that, that I've left off here. I mean, again, if you're, if you're thinking of something as silly putty, there's all sorts of uh, crevices and, and things that need to be uh, filled up to kind of smooth out the edges. So there's a couple, just a little laundry list of things I don't quite have uh, answers for, but I encounter every now and then uh, that I'll go over. And that is, uh, you know, I think, I think there's also, this notion doesn't come up as much as you would like it to in a good way. But oftentimes in an organization, you have, um, I, don't, I don't know what these things are usually called, but they kind of like take a page from uh, that sort of like ThoughtWorks wheel of, of, uh, of fun that comes out every year. That's sort of like, here are new technologies and things you should consider, and the timeline of, of which we should cons consider them if they're on horizon one, two, or three, or whatever. So oftentimes, traditionally, EAs get involved in that. And the answer is inevitably always like, I don't know, we need like to use blockchains for ledgers and AR and probably Kotlin or something crazy. And meanwhile, you're just like, I'm still trying to figure out how to decompile this mainframe stuff so we can change how we do banking. And they don't really seem to be as useful uh, as an analysis as, as you would want. They often are sort of just like uh, distracting like shiny objects to throw at people who want to drive budget and make sure you're doing uh, important things. Not that I'm cynical about that kind of process. But in a more genuine way, there are always plenty of new technologies to try out, very pragmatic ones. And what I see in some groups, there's, there's a large insurance company I'm thinking of in particular, is that the enterprise architects uh, transformed role, this little group, getting back to building a platform was to really figure out what are the new types of infrastructures, the new types of development that are out there. Let's go figure out over the course of maybe about three months, right? You time box it to be extremely small. Let's figure out some things that we should try out. And they end up doing more than just uh, proof of concepting or POCing it, but they actually do sort of operational POCs. Like, let's pick a small business-facing application and try to run it on this platform and study if that actually works or not. And then we'll expand that to the rest of the organization. So this idea of not so much writing a document that you deliver to like the board or whatever, at, at, you know, right a month before the annual uh, budgeting cycle completes or something like that, but really generally going out and, and trying to uh, figure out new systems to use and kind of innovate the process that you have is something that I've seen some EAs doing here and there. And then, and then to kind of summarize uh, uh, one of the points I've been making, but that comes up over and over again, is that a lot of the sort of like uh, methodology or process or ways we should do things around here, uh, I often think of that, especially when you're moving from a traditional sort of service-driven, project-driven organization to more of a kind of like DevOps, uh, product-driven organization. You're constantly trying to reprogram the organization. And uh, now maybe all of y'all are, now maybe programming's evolved that it's perfect every time, but I remember that programming was basically just constantly failing until like the test passed and figuring out the right way to write something, right? But it's that loop of trying something new and figuring out why it doesn't work and learning from it. And that same process actually gets used by managers to change things over. I mean, management that works, uh, usually, is they go through that same process of failing and failing and learning and then reprogramming things and eventually getting to a state uh, that works well. And also, I mean, I know things like uh, annual performance goals and even OKRs, if you can figure out whatever that nonsense is, versus KPIs and things like that. They seem really onerous, but you can think of those as sort of like the tests that you run over how the organization is being programmed to see if it's actually working or not. So that kind of work, especially at more of a technical level, is something that I see EAs participating in a lot and uh, helping out with. And then finally, the part that I think, um, like if you read all of the old literature, so to speak, on enterprise architecture, as I did because I didn't have anything more thrilling to do one summer, uh, was 
there's this obsession with mapping to the business or mapping the business. It's always mapping and business and some word in between there. Uh, and that is kind of easy to dismiss and kind of be all upset about. Like it's a good example of synergies type of words. Uh, but the EA, hopefully, should still be able to do this task of saying, uh, you know, we're a retail business, uh, not an insurance business, or we're, a, we're an escalator software IoT iPad using business, not a uh, delivering food in, uh, you know, Jakarta business. And there's sort of this notion of we can talk to the business side and not only tell them what's not possible, which is typically what us computer people, our favorite thing to do is to tell people negatives and what's not possible. But hopefully they can also start to think about, well, if you did want to get into this business, here's the feasibility of how the, those 500 teams could help out with it. Here's, we think of our organization as a whole system or a process. What can we actually do new for you that might help you out with what you're, you're asking for? So those are some things that, uh, especially the last one, because it's easy to kind of like dismiss that as like all that old 2006 enterprise architecture uh, thinking. But those are things that, again, more silly putty roles for, uh, for EAs to get involved in. So then finally, I, didn't, I couldn't really think of a visual for this, so I just used this, so it's completely unrelated. Although look how sad it is, this guy's about to shave his beard off. Or even sadder, he's not, right? Which is another thought. Uh, so I think, I think there's this really, uh, so there's this guy, Mark Schwartz, who used to work for um, one of the, the friendly part of the US immigration agency that like welcomes people in. Uh, he now works at Amazon, like, you know, bless his heart. Uh, but he was a CIO there and he's got a couple of really great books that kind of go over this idea of not only what enterprise architecture is, but what is IT value, right? Like what does that even mean to an organization? And there's this notion that he's developed uh, over and over again. And that is at an organization level to think about the enterprise architecture as a noun, as a core asset that the company has, right? Just like you would think about it, a factory or a brand or sort of trade secrets, but this thing, this asset that you're building for the organization, not just like your, uh, your really annoying set of intranet stuff that no one uses, like a cost center or something saddled, but you wanna think about what IT is doing as an asset that you're building up. And in that sense, I mean, it's obviously a very hopeful, uh, nice way of thinking about things. But hopefully what that means is that the, if you actually get to the state where it's malleable and it's helpful and it doesn't just hold you down like a, like a legacy boat anchor, but instead enables your organization to do interesting things, then it becomes much more valuable and hopefully your life becomes much more interesting, right? Because you're not just decompiling your COBOL or whatever uh, you may be doing. So that's the other thing that I think is important for an EA to think about is like, in the same way that a product team has this one product, right? I think the mentality they and all the way up to like a CIO level should have is like, we're building this product of a delivery engine that delivers all these things for the rest of the organization. And what do we do to constantly pay attention to that and garden it and evolve it? So I think that mindset is a lot different than like, what I'm delivering is that we satisfied all 300 of our audit controls and did our part by the date and gave it to someone else and good luck to them, right? Like you don't wanna get obsessed with the process. You wanna be able to set up what the actual outcomes and end goals and how you make people's lives uh, a little bit better. Also, I guess he doesn't like eyebrows. So uh, with that, that's, that's uh, my little overview of, it's nothing very definitive, but it's what I've observed uh, EAs are useful for, so to speak, and what they have been doing to kind of fit into this uh, more DevOps agile world where you're delivering software every week or every day. So I have a very old, version of uh, sort of what large organizations are doing to change around. Look, I got the word strategy in it as well. Hopefully that's not off-putting. Uh, but there's a new version I'm almost done with that hopefully will get published early next year. You can get it down there at cote.coffee and you can read the rest. Uh, but there's a section on there that write, has written up a lot of this, as long with, with culture and other things, if you're interested in those things. Uh, and I'll be around uh, for just a little bit if you're interested in asking more questions or any questions. Uh, and with that, thanks for having me. It's always fun to talk with people.